Congressman, I was about to introduce you and say a little more. Hey, how are you? Hi, how you doing? Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're so lucky to have you here with us. And I've already explained that you're actually in Washington because you're working. And I was about to tell folks that you represent the 23rd district of Texas. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about your district and describe it for us. Sure.、Uh, my district in, in Southwest Texas is 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of border from Eagle Pass, Texas, all the way to El Paso. It takes、um, 10 and a half hours to drive across my district at 80 miles an hour, which is the speed limit in, in most of the district. And I found out a couple weekends ago it's not the speed limit in all the districts.、Um, it's a <laughs> No, it's a a a 71% percent,、uh, Latino district, and it's a district that I've been representing、um, for now my third term in Congress. And when you think about the issue of the border, I have more border than any other member of Congress.、Um, I spent nine and a half years as an undercover officer in the CIA, chasing、uh, bad people all across the country.、Uh, so when it comes to securing our border, it, it's something I, I know a little bit about. One of the things I learned recently, which I hadn't known before, is that your district is actually the size, I think, of the state of Georgia. That's right. It's, it's larger than 26 states, roughly the size of, of the state of Georgia.、Uh, so it's, it's pretty big. So, as an expert in national security and as a member of Congress, you've been called upon to think about issues. Related to immigration, and in recent years, particularly about the border wall, what is your reaction to President Trump's statement that we need a big, beautiful wall that would stretch across our border and at 18 to 30 feet high? I've been saying since I first ran for Congress back in 2009. This is not a new topic. That building a 30-foot-high concrete structure from sea to shining sea is the most expensive and least effective way. To do border security,、um, there are parts of the border where border patrol's response time to a threat is measured in hours to days. If your response time is measured in hours to days, then a wall is is not a physical barrier.、Um, we should be having technology along the border. We should know、uh, what's called. We should have operational control of our border, which means you know everything that's going back and forth across it.、We、can do a lot of that with technology. We also need more folks within a border patrol,、uh, but but in addition to doing all this, one of the things we should be able to do is streamline legal immigration. If you're going to be a productive member of our society,、uh, let's get you here as quickly as possible. Well, let's do it legally, and if we're able to streamline that, then you're going to see some of the pressures、uh, relieved along our border and allow、uh, men and women in border patrol to focus on. Um, you know, human trafficking and drug trafficking organizations as well. Congressman,、um, there's also been a conversation nationally about using emergency funds to build the border wall and taking those funds from the United States military. What has your position been on that issue? You know, I'm one of the few Republicans up here that has opposed that effort.、Uh, we are just now rebuilding. Um, our, our military and taking funds away from making sure that our our brothers and sisters, our wives and our husbands、um, have the training and equipment they need in order、um, to take care of us in in, in far flung places.、Um, taking money away from them is not an efficient use、uh, of our resources, especially if it's going to build a you know I always say it's a fourth century、uh, solution to a a twenty first century problem. And the the reality is, what we should be focusing on is some of the other root causes of, of this problem. And many of your speakers today have talked about that. And and some of those key root pro, you know, root problems are violence, lack of economic opportunity, and extreme poverty,、uh, specifically in the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. What would、um, you? We should be working. I was going to ask what, what you would recommend the United States government does to address the underlying what we call push factors or root causes in those three countries in Central America. Well, one of the things I learned as an undercover officer in the CIA is be nice with nice guys and tough with tough guys.、Um, and and one of the principles of being nice with nice guys is to strengthen our our alliances.、Um, we have a number of programs currently in these three countries that. USAID and State Department is doing to address 
uh, this violence issue. Uh, we know in, in El Salvador, one of the problems was that the police were corrupt. And so we've, per we've worked with the Salvadorians to purge the police, um, rehire new folks, use you know, com um, community policing tactics. These are tactics that the men and women in, in the United States of America and, and police forces uh, use every single day. And when we did this in certain communities, guess what happened? We saw a decrease in the violence that was happening in those communities. And then we also saw a decrease in the number of people that were leaving those areas to try to come to the United States illegally. So it, 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 it's a fraction of the cost to solve the problem there uh, before it, it ultimately reaches our border. And, and one of the reasons that you have violence and, and crime is, is political corruption and, and the lack of of central governments to protect its citizens. And so this is something we should be continuing to work on. We shouldn't be decreasing the amount of money that we have that we're sending to these countries. I actually think we should be increasing it. I believe the first thing, and we should have done this months ago, is select a special representative for the Northern Triangle. That's a senior diplomat that's gonna to work to make sure that we're using all of our levers of, of power um, to help these three countries, and then that we're doing it in a coordinated effort. We should also, this is not just a problem for the United States and Mexico, this is a problem for the entire Western Hemisphere. So where is the Organization of American States? Where is the International Development Bank? And we should be having a collective plan to address this, these root causes. And when you talk about violence, a, a lot of times we talk about um, these terrible games like MS-13, but it's also violence like women being beaten by their husbands and they have nobody else to go to and they are unable to to deal with this current problem so these are the types of issues uh, that we, we should be increasing our diplomacy increasing our economic so development Congressman, aid please those problems. i want to take you now from thinking about the root causes in central america to thinking about the separation of children and families in the united states Starting in April 2018, the Trump administration began a no-tolerance policy for immigrants, people seeking refugee status, asylum in the United States. And that led to the separation of 2,700 children in the first year that that program was run. Now, I want to address this with you, and I want to separate it up front into two different conversations. One of the things that the administration did was file legal court papers saying that one of the primary purposes of the separations was to act as a deterrent against people coming to the United States. And I want to talk for a moment about that from a moral perspective and to get your views. We shouldn't be doing it, period. It's, 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 it's real simple. And guess what? It wasn't a deterrent. Um, you only saw an increase in the amount of uh, illegal immigration. And when you're sitting, you know, debating a strategy, your strategy, if somebody comes up with the idea of snatching a child out of their mother's arms, you need to go back to, to the drawing board. This is not what, what the United States of America stands for. This is not a Republican or a Democrat or independent thing. Uh, this is a, a human decency thing. And so, so using that strategy, it didn't achieve the ultimate purpose, and ultimately, the, the, the amount of, of research that is done and the impact that the detention of children has, especially if it's over 21 days, has on their development and, and their future is disastrous. So we shouldn't be trying to detain our children for any more than 21 days, and we should be getting children, if, if they're in our custody, we should be taking care of them humanely and making sure they're with people uh, that can provide them a safe, and, and loving it hard. I, I would challenge you even on the 21-day number, but for the purposes of this conversation, I want to follow up on something you just said, which is that both that it's wrong to detain children and that it's not effective. So the question then is why does the administration continue to do it when we've seen 900 additional children separated from their parents since the summer of 2018? Why is this happening? Well, that's something that you would have to ultimately ask the administration. This is, these are questions that I've been asking. Uh, the Tornillo facility is in my district. Uh, these are, these are, are, are um, buildings that are not designed uh, to hold anybody for, for multiple days, let alone children. Um, we should be making sure 
that if they are in our custody, a lot of times uh, for the unaccompanied children, we don't have a, we don't know of, a, of, a, of a, a patron or a family member in the United States, and we should make sure that they're in facilities where they're able to go to school and have uh, proper food and, and health care. Um, and if we're able to find a, a sponsor or a family member, let's get them into that, those custody while they're waiting uh, for their immig immigration court case. And that's the other issue here. When you have a backlog of cases, I think it's now 900,000 um, cases that are backlog. We should be able to do an immigration hearing uh, within nine months. I think most of the legal uh, community thinks that is uh, enough time to do something like this so that we can um, facilitate um, whether uh, someone or an individual is able to stay in the United States or they're going to have to be returned back to their home country rather than being in this limbo for five years. If we think about the asylum system today, where people are coming and saying that they have a credible threat, that they will be persecuted back home, and we think about the fact that on average it's about two years for someone to get an asylum hearing, that many people are not represented as they go through that process. It makes me think about something that they say in the healthcare space all the time, which is that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so as you think about this and think about how we would redesign this system to not do what we're doing, which is years and years of detention and separations and hardship for people seeking, and again, in asylum being a lawful United States government process, for people seeking to enter our country lawfully, what should we do? I've tried to increase by $4 billion the amount of resources that HHS has in order to specifically deal ultimately with children. I think we need more immigration judges in order to process these cases, and I think we need to ensure that folks that can get representation. I've been able to work with a number of lawyers up and down uh, the border to make sure that they're you know, being able to get access uh, to the folks um, that are, are, are having these problems. And so this is, this is something that we should be able to design. And, and ultimately, when it comes to children, we should be doing everything we can in our custody in order to, in order to take care of them. So I have two more questions for you before I'm going to let you go back to work. The first is about our focus in the United States on the questions of immigration. Because if you look at some of the statistics, you see that of people who are undocumented in the United States, the majority of people have overstayed on visas. They haven't come through the border. If you look at the people who try to enter the country who are on the terrorist watch list, they enter overwhelmingly through the airports and not through the border. If we look at drugs coming into the United States, which has been a huge part of this conversation, the vast majority of those drugs come through our ports and through other points of entry, not through backpacks on people crossing the border. So the thing I always ask and I always worry about with government is that we focus so much on one thing. And my question for you is whether we are focused on this conversation nationally about the border every day and every minute of every day, whether it's we're looking completely in the wrong direction. I would agree with your premise. Um, when you have, let's, let's start with the economic benefits. When you have a 3.6% unemployment, what does that mean? That means you need folks in every industry, whether it's agriculture or artificial intelligence. So why aren't we streamlining legal immigration. We should be able to make this market-based in order to have folks um, come in and, and, and be productive members of our society. Uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to the drug issue you're talking about, yes, it's in our ports of entry, but it's also coming into our shores. Uh, Coast Guard is only able to action 25% of the known intelligence they have on drugs coming in, into our country. The, the metric that we should be measuring, if are we seeing a decrease uh, of deaths from, from overdose from drugs overseas? Are we seeing an, a decrease in, in, in illegal immigration? It's not how many miles of fencing um, that, we, that, we, that we have ultimately built. And so we have benefited uh, from the brain drain of every other country for the last couple of decades. I want to see that continue, and I want to see that continue with a hardworking drain. And I can tell you this, the last Congress, um, uh, Pete Aguilar is a, a Democrat from California, and I had a piece of legislation called the USA Act, strong border security, streamlined legal immigration, fixed DACA. 
1.2 million kids who have only known the United States of America as their home. These kids are, I should say, young men and women. Uh, they're already Americans. Let's, let's not have them go through any more uh, uncertainty and make that ultimately happen. We had 245 people that were willing to sign this bill in the law that wasn't allowed to come forward under a Republican speaker. And also the current Democratic speaker hasn't brought this bill to and something that we'd be able to pass. So I want to close, um, and you are perhaps most famous. Um, I don't know if that's fair, but you took a road trip with Beto O'Rourke from your district to Washington, D.C., and you become known for reaching across the aisle and engaging in these bipartisan conversations. And one of the things I've seen you say repeatedly is to talk about how we are all united. And I think when we think about the language of immigration and we start hearing words about enemies and militarization, I think the real question is how do, we, how do we convince all Americans to understand what you say that more unites us than divides us? Crisscrossing a district like mine that's truly 50-50, 50% Democrat, 50% Republican, it's been very clear to me uh, that way more unites divides us and we focus on the things that we agree we'll be all better off. And, and now I'm, I'm not going to get a, a perfect attendance award for going to church, but I do remember when, when Jesus was in the second temple and the Pharisees asked him, what's the most important commandment? He said to love thy Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But people forget, he also said equally as important is to love thy neighbor like thyself. And if we remember that and realize what it would mean and what you would have to be going through to be living in a situation that you may send your child on a 3,000 mile perilous journey because that's what you think only thing for their future as only thing that, that, that you can do to make sure their future is bright. If we all remember that situation um, and, and think what we would do in that situation, I think we'd ultimately be better. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. <laughs>